Welcome to the New Planner Podcast, where it's all about helping you successfully enter the financial planning profession and accelerate your financial planning career. This podcast will help you understand the profession, become familiar with the various career paths available to you, and avoid the mistakes that limit your success. Join your host, Caleb Brown, to explore the human side of creating a successful planning career through interviews, personal experience, and insights from the trenches. Let's get started. Welcome to the 185th episode of the New Planner Podcast. This is Caleb Brown, your host. My guest today is Nina Kamrani an Associate Wealth Advisor at Monumental Financial Planning in Washington, D.C. Nina stops by the show to discuss how she transitioned from a successful career in a large retailer to an entry-level financial planner role. Listen as she discusses how she got hired by Target, what her role was, how she learned to have successful outcomes for difficult conversations, motivate her team, and lead people much older than her, and while she enjoyed her time there, ultimately decided to pivot. Check out the middle where she talks about how she found an opening for an entry-level position but was hesitant to apply and ended up getting hired for a custom role the firm created for her and how the skills she gained at Target have helped her succeed and earn a promotion after eight months. Stay tuned to the end where she shares what it was like working in an admin-heavy role at the beginning before she was promoted to an associate and some tips for newer planners. If you're considering a career change from corporate America to financial planning, then this episode is for you. Hi, Nina. Welcome to the New Planner Podcast. Hello, hello. How are you? Hey, it has been a while since we chatted. So thanks so much for coming on. Looking forward to just reconnecting and uh, just learning more about your story and your your progression. So maybe just kick us off with what you're doing right now, what your role is. What do you spend most of your day doing? Yeah, yeah. So I am an associate wealth advisor here at Monumental. And I spend a good chunk of my time working with our clients, building financial plans. I just actually finished a meeting with a client helping her with her budget. So lots of different things going on. And then on the other side of things, the investment management route, helping, you know, create the portfolios, put the models together. So a little bit of everything, I would say, (laughs) a lot of learning. Keeping it interesting, right? So yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the cool things about this profession, right? I mean, there's it's something different every day. I mean, like these questions that the clients come up with, it's like, man, this is like really cool. I mean, you know, I, I think we had somebody on, I think it was uh, a few episodes ago that's like, you know, when I first started out, I was worried about being able to answer all the questions, but like now I'm like, I kind of like it when I can't answer because now I can go research and learn something new. <laughs> so Yeah, no, that's so true. I, I like to think of myself as a sponge where I am at. And so something that I've just lived by, I don't know since when, is trying to learn at least one new thing every day. So I'm yeah. in the same place as them. If I can learn something, whether it's about a client, something personal about them, or just something about the industry that I just haven't yet gotten into, um, it's, it's what I look forward to. Hey, tell us a little bit maybe about your firm, just for the context. I mean, just how many people you serve and what kind of clients are they? Yeah, so we have... I want to say around close to 300, 320 households, and we work with a lot of our clients, our advisory. I want to say at least half of them have financial plans, and everyone, we pretty much do investment management for them. Um, So we like to explain it as having two sides of the business, investment management, financial planning. You can do one, either, both, Um, and that's ultimately how we help them. Okay. So they have a choice. And I I guess for you, what, what side is most interesting to you? Financial planning for sure. Um, I feel so comfortable with the topic, even though I'm, I I'm still studying for the CFP, but I love the, just the multifaceted approach that financial planning takes um investment management love it i know it's a part of it but sometimes honestly it gets a little bit intimidating yeah there, there's a lot there right there I mean, is yeah it, yeah so let you said you're studying for the cfp when are you planning on taking that uh in march so i'm planning on the march 2025 exam i've started uh the courses and so i'm chugging along but um it's definitely a process it, and, and yeah, let's back up. I mean, you, so you're starting the courses. So, cause you, you actually did not get a financial planning degree. So talk to us about sort of your, 
how, how you even got interested in financial planning? Where did all this start? Yeah. So, well, this takes me all the way back to college. Um, I got in to George Mason. I went there, graduated May 2020. But going into college, Ouch, that was a, that was a tough, know, tough year. <laughs> I know. It, no graduation. It was a whole oh, orde- ordeal. Um, but I went into college not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and so all I knew was what I didn't want to do, which was I didn't want to be sitting in a cubicle all day, not talking with anyone. And I didn't want to be doing the same repetitive thing over and over again. So that really was pretty vague going into college. You know, like what what degree can you get with that? So I decided to do business management. I figured, you know, I'll start off with this. If I figure out what I do want to do, at least I can translate that into a whole bunch of different industries um, and hopefully make my way somehow. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to go. I mean, if you don't know what your general business, I mean, that's probably a good place to start. You know, you can go a lot of different directions there. Yeah, exactly. And it was a little bit more specific than general studies. So um, I thought we would do that. Um, but I, I went through college, started that management route. Um, I believe it was my sophomore year. I learned that there was a leadership minor. So I added that under my belt. And I started just finding my passion in just leadership, management, and that whole ordeal. Did great in my business classes. I think accounting, as I was taking accounting, I was like, do I want to be an accountant? Maybe not. You know, I don't think the CPA is for me. Um, When I took my finance classes, the thing about Mason's finance class for, for the business degree, it was very business related. It wasn't personal. Um, and so I liked the finances, but I wanted it to be more personal. And Mason at the time didn't have a personal financial planning major or department, which they did recently add last year. Um, but at the time I figured, okay, well, I'm already halfway into this degree. I'll try it out. I'll find something. And the concept of personal finance never even hit me until after I graduated, um, which was a lovely time. But during the, I want to say my junior year of college, I was at a career fair at Mason. I was looking for a job where I won't be in a cubicle all day. (laughs) And I came across Target which really never entered my mind. I was like, like the retailer, the retailer. Yeah, the retailer (laughs) target. Exactly. I was a little bit confused. I was wondering what they were hiring for. um, And I thought it was different, new. I spoke with the person at the table and they said, yeah, this is a leadership internship where you'll be essentially shadowing the different leaders at the store level. Um, and you can see what all the different departments do and just how you lead the store. And I figured, okay, well, I'm not going to be in a cubicle, a cubicle at this job. It's definitely different from what a lot of folks in the business school were doing. Everyone was going for, you know, the big four or um, different big firms. And while I'm an ambitious person, I also wanted to do something different. So I figured, you know, we'll do retail for now, see how I like it. Um, and we'll go from there. So I accepted, went through the whole interview process and it was great. And honestly, I owe all of, or majority of the skills that I honed there to, to where I am today. So it was, it was a good starting point. Yeah. It sounded like that was valuable experience and and kudos for securing that. I mean, that was probably pretty competitive and, you know, a, a big deal. So you got to see inside a large large retailer so you you may you kind of alluded to the skills what what did you learn or what did you notice or what kind of building blocks did you start to, to be able to build upon well the thing that i liked about my experience with them was i wasn't just at one 
Target store, I went to multiple different stores until I landed what I would call like my home store. So I was bouncing around and I was able to that way see how a bunch of different leaders lead their teams um, and how all of that worked. And I think that was what allowed me to understand that, hey, leadership is not a one one way track. You can lead people differently. And that was the starting point of that. Now, what I really learned was public speaking, how to have those difficult conversations with people, with it being retail. I mean, customer service, you have conversations with customers coming into the store. Um, All of that was valuable. And then I got some HR skills because I had to put schedules together. I gained, um, I had to learn the hard way of, hey, just because I there's people 20 years older than me that I'm leading or people my same age that I'm leading, I need to understand the way to do that and that, you know, I don't necessarily want to be their friend. I, I don't necessarily need to be liked by everyone, but I can lead in the best way that I can lead for the person that I'm leading because every individual is so different. Um, and so that's, those are just some tidbits of, of what I got. Yeah. The one that kind of sticks out to me is, I mean, here you are, you know, new college grad, you know, and you're leading somebody who has been there a lot older, been there a lot longer. I mean, uh, you know, like, how did you do that? How did you get them to do what you wanted them to? It was hard. It was hard because I also come from um, a culture where it's very big on respecting elders. And so I didn't know where that fine line was. Like, if I'm telling them what to do, is that rude? If I'm telling them what to do and they don't listen, how do I have that conversation with them? Um, And it was more of a confidence thing for me just understanding that, hey, I'm in this position because I have what it takes to lead everyone. Um, And so understanding that was a big factor to helping me do that. But also something that I learned is everyone works differently. So I could have someone, doesn't even matter the age, who needs to be led by me telling them exactly what to do and being more of that micromanager but then i have people that prefer me to just tell them hey get this done as long as they get it done at some point during their shift or their day and i trust them with that that's what helps them the best so it was just really gauging their personality what type of rewards they like they like to be um did they like to get a cookie? Did they like to <laughs> literally be told, hey, great job. Thanks so much for, for all that you do. Did they want that day off so that they could spend it with their with their family? So it was really learning and understanding the team and getting to know them that really helped uh, helped me in the end. So you couldn't treat everybody the same. Sounds like a, and, but you still had to motivate them and make sure they got the result. Yeah, it, it was a puzzle. It was a puzzle. Yeah. And, and it's something that translates to real life. I mean, and anywhere you go, um, everyone is different. I mean, I had introverts and extroverts that I I was leading. Um, It was very, it was a big real world learning experience. Um, And it was, it was great. Did you ever have to fire anybody there? Uh, Yes, I did. Wow. I did. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, here you are. Let's say you were there like right out of school. So, I mean, here you're like 20, I know. early 20s. I and you're know. You're firing it, somebody. I know. that It was, I was learning so much and that was a difficult, one of the difficult conversations. Um, you ultimately need to be honest with everyone. I mean, there comes a chance, a time when second chances can be given, but then after conversation after conversation after conversation. I mean, you can only have so many follow-ups before it means that someone's not putting any effort in whatsoever. So it really, it was hard. A lot of the times it was harder because I was also teaching my, I had two team leaders under me who were leading the team members. 
And so not only was I doing occasional one-off firings, but I had to also teach and be a mentor for my leads on, hey, when you have these conversations, this is how you have them. Or when you have these conversations, maybe add this tidbit in or um, do this. And it was a strange place that I was in because I was learning it and I was also teaching it as I was going along. And um, it was interesting. So what what happened? You got tired of firing people, then you just transferred to new uh, to financial planning. Is that what you did? You know, yeah, no. <laughs> um, it wasn't just firing; it was hiring <laughs> as well. But uh, ultimately, I mean, my boss back at Target told me this, and it really stuck with me. And it was that Target and retail in general is not for everybody. Um, some people can be there for the long haul, but not everyone can, and that's perfectly okay. And so that was, was something that was important for me to realize and understand as I made the transition to where I am right now. And maybe talk to us a little bit more about that. So you were sort of like, okay, maybe I need to start looking for something else. I don't know about this retail thing, you know, the... The hours kind of aren't that great, you know? Yeah, it's like, and, like, and that was a huge part of it. I ultimately um, wanted to find a position in life that would provide me with flexibility because ultimately, not that I have one currently, but at some point I would like to, you know, have kids, have family, the whole shebang. And so I wanted something, and I was thinking really young about it, but I wanted something that would be flexible, that I could use my skills, where I could, you know, meet people, build those relationships, and I would be happy, but make enough to live in this world, right? Um, And when I was at Target, I came to that realization about the flexibility piece, but also about, hey, you know, my hours aren't the best and i really wanted to go back to school i really wanted to continue my education i wanted to do finance although at the time it was more general finance and it wasn't personal finance quite yet but i realized i couldn't in the position that i was in study for that and work at the same time there are people that can do that and kudos to everyone that does that but it was not how I could have done it. So I really made the decision to leave based on, okay, I want to continue my education and I want to go into finance and I can't do that if I stay here. So that's what kind of shifted me into that direction. And then did you go back to school and get get some other degree or did you pivot right into financial planning? No, I pivoted right into financial planning. I had a conversation with my parents because I'm very close with them. And I I was like, hey, you know, I'm really thinking of leaving Target. Want to get into finance. Um, I want to continue my education. I want to shift in that industry. I don't know realistically how I can do that when I'm here. Um, And on top of all of that, Target, for the last several months I was there, was um, really affecting me mentally with my mental health. And so I had to take a step back for those reasons as well. And so I asked my parents, I said, hey, you know, what are your thoughts? Is this something that you see me doing? Because, you know, they they know me, they raised me for a good chunk of my life. Um, and I gathered their advice and my dad, he actually started looking for jobs as I was still at Target. And then when I made the decision to leave, um, that was around the time that he had found the job posting on New Planner Recruiting. So I, I kind of give kudos to him. Wait, wait a minute. Okay. I didn't know that. Your dad found a job posting from us. He did. Oh, he that- did. <laughs> and he came to me. He said, Nina, I think you're going to be great for this. And I looked at him. I looked at the job. I looked at the qualifications and I thought he was crazy. I, I was like, well, I literally don't fit a good chunk of these qualifications. I don't have these licenses. I've never had experience in the industry. What makes you think this is the entry level job (laughs) to pivot my way into this industry? And I was 
battling with the decision to even apply or not. And, you know, I read somewhere that women don't apply to jobs that they don't qualify for, like, every little yes, that's right. qualification piece. And my dad was telling me to apply, even though he knew I didn't have those qualifications. So I figured, you know, the worst I can get is a no. Let's just do it. Let's see what happens. And then we kind of just took off from there. That is so cool. I did not realize that, Nina. Man, I, I need to, next time I'm in the D.C. area, just stop by and <laughs> buy, buy him dinner or something. <laughs> but that was so cool that he's like, I think he'd be perfect for this. Yeah, he did. And it's crazy because he believed in me before I did. And, um, you know, totally eternally grateful for that and just grateful for how everything turned out. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting way to land a job for sure. And, and we're so glad me and the industry and your current team members are so thankful that when you went to your parents and say, no, don't leave target, the corporate America, the corporate car, the, 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 the fine, you know, the fine benefit pension plan, like, no, you can never do that. You got a safe salary. Like don't go to this financial planning stuff and do budgeting and investments and say, yeah, that's amazing that they took the approach that they did. Yeah. And I'm really glad that that they've always been, um, a good different perspective that I could gather for like big life decisions. So I always lean back on them on top of my friends, but Hey, you know, they have a few years over them. So, yeah. So chance encounter, I think that's the first time that's ever happened since uh, we've, we've been in business. I love it. And you, you got in our system, kind of worked through that. And then your current firm, I mean, you're, so what were you excited about with them? Why were you interested in their role? So originally that the job posting was for an associate wealth advisor position. And so when I went through that interview process, it actually took quite a, a while. Um, it was a two month month process, I think. Um, which I don't know if it's normal or not, to be honest, but it was a two month process. And ultimately what I really appreciated was because I didn't have all the qualifications for the associate wealth advisor role, um, those two months that they were, I'm assuming, interviewing and doing all these things, they were also curating a role specific to me that I could do because I didn't have the licenses or the experience. And so going into this company, they created like a custom role in a way because they saw, hey, we see you as an associate advisor, just not yet. And we will support you to get there, which is what I really appreciated um, and why I said yes, ultimately. That's so cool. What did you do to get these people to take a chance on you? I mean, because I mean, I, I, creating a custom role, no one, you don't have any experience. I mean, yeah. we've already talked about, I mean, you, you <laughs> did get quite the learning and the sort of trial by fire and you had to grow up pretty quick at Target and you're bringing that to the table, which is a substantial, but how did you get these people to take a chance on you? I was authentic to me first and foremost, but the interview was a two-part process. Um, and so it was, you know, your basic in-person interview. And then the second part was to present a mock financial plan. Um, and I had never even looked at a financial plan before. And so when they when they sent me that and they said, okay, well, now all you have to do is just present this financial plan to us and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, boy. <laughs> It, it took me back to college. It sounded like a nice little project, but um, I was able to use, you know, my public speaking skills. I was able to use my lack of knowledge to dumb it down to where, okay, if I was a client and I'm not even that knowledgeable on all the little details that go into like the numbers, social security, Medicare, all these things how can I explain it so that I understand it so that I feel, you know, secure and confident in the advisors that are reading me this plan and how can I do that? And so I read it to my boss now. Um, I presented it as if I was presenting it to myself. And although he asked me some questions that I did not know how to answer, um, I was 
confident enough and i guess i i guess i did a good job i mean i'm here at the end of the day (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah yeah Well, well it all goes back to i think what your father said like you can do this i believe in you i mean here you are like presenting a financial plan for for john who's very experienced and and doing this a long time and he saw enough there to say no you know what we're gonna we're gonna make a slight adjustment. She's too good to let somebody else get her. We want her, and I mean that's something I've been trying to preach to one firm owners, but also the candidates um, for for years. I mean because if you wouldn't have applied, or they would have sort of been like, well, I don't know. She checks ninety nine point you know eight percent of the boxes, but not a hundred percent. We're gonna pass. Which some firms out there do that. They do, yeah. You you wouldn't be in the profession, probably. You'd be doing something else. I wouldn't. This was my... I had been applying to other jobs, but this was one of the ones that really gave me a chance. And I mean, they proved it with, with how I got here and just that custom role, so to speak. And a few months down the line, and here I am as an associate wealth advisor. So I did get to the point of that role um, eventually. And I'm just, I'm just thankful that they took a chance. And how long were you in the custom role they made before you got promoted to the associate wealth advisor? Um, well, I started in August of 22 and I did that until March of 23. Um, when it was after I had passed I, my 66 license that they were like, okay, you are ready to roll and, um, got that promotion to associate wealth advisor. And how that's great. So you obviously passed the licensing, but what were you, what did they have you doing and how were you developing and building skills and confidence at that point? Well, what a lot of what my day to day looked like, I was sitting in on meetings. I was meeting clients, getting to know them. I wasn't uh, putting in too much input because I didn't have the knowledge quite yet. So it was really just relationship building, getting to know the different processes behind the scenes, the back office work. You know, how do we open a new account? How do we organize our CRM? And then on top of that, they were really supporting my studies for the licensing. And so a good chunk of my day was also just being able to study for the exam. That's great. Right. It sounds yeah. like they really have provided a good opportunity for you. So when do you feel like it really clicked? Like when you're, okay, I'm a career changer. I'm still early in my career. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm I'm finally understanding what's going on. I'm finally getting confidence. I can now call a client and work with them and talk them about their budget or their taxes or whatever it may be. I would say, let's see, we're in 2024, summer of last year. So sometime July, August last year. So it's only really been a year where the imposter syndrome that I had kind of went away. I do have moments where that still pops up, but um, it, it was then where I was able to have those conversations where I was comfortable picking up the phone and talking with a client about a certain situation and it didn't take too long but also i i had to become okay with knowing that i don't always have the answer and that's okay but i'll get you the answer i'll get back to you on it it just might not be at this moment and other than the imposter syndrome again which i've said multiple times here everybody has what was the most challenging i mean there's there's other career changers out there that are could be listening to this, could get, you know, that, hey, I'm, I'm in corporate America. I want to get out. What was the most difficult part of the transition? The most difficult part was coming to terms with, well, not terms, but just understanding that I can do it. Like, there's nothing physically stopping me from applying to a job outside of the industry. There's nothing that will hurt me if I get a rejection, per se. And as long as I find a company that is willing to support me and what it is that I do and that has that open door policy where, hey, I can share if I'm not comfortable with something and I'm supported, um, 
that's what helped me. And also John has been sitting in on these meetings with clients for so long. And if I had ever been in a situation where I didn't know how to answer, he would be there to back me up and to provide that answer, which then taught me, okay, that's how you answer it in this situation. Um, And so it was a lot of support from John, a lot of support from the team here, and just my own confidence, really. Yeah, that's what all the business coaches and entrepreneur coaches are like. like your your biggest barrier to your success is you. Is you? Yeah, it really <laughs> it's is. Not an, it's not an external thing. It's 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 mostly you. So, uh, th- this is this is awesome, uh, Nina. I mean, I just love how you got connected with us and just sort of the progression. I mean, coming from from Target. I mean, anybody can do this. Anybody can come from any other profession, any other business any other company and do this and with retail just to touch on it retail sometimes seems like a big day-to-day like you're always just trying to get through the day trying to make sure customers are satisfied you have you know big rushes at certain times of the day no matter what store you're in and it sometimes is difficult to take a step back and ask yourself is this really what i want to be doing and if not Ultimately, it's a question of, is this something that you're okay with putting on hold? Are your dreams and your goals okay putting on hold? And if not, I know it's hard to when you're in retail to advocate for yourself, but I'm telling you it's possible. Like, you can do it. Thanks for sharing that. It's really good stuff. Any other final tips or closing thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yes, if you don't think that you have all the qualifications for a job apply anyway (laughs) (laughs) love it thanks so much for coming on nina yeah thanks thanks for joining us for this episode of the new planner podcast if you're ready to discover the top career paths for financial planners and see which track is best for you we created a free guide to help you Grab your copy of the Financial Planner Career Roadmap at newplannerrecruiting.com slash roadmap. There, you'll also find more tools and resources all created to help you build a successful financial planning career. Tune back in next week for another episode. And until then, we're here to help you succeed.